In this lecture, we are going to talk about the two important processes called sensation and perception and how do they relate to each other. And then later on, you will realize that the processes of sensation and perception are two important processes in order for us to make sense of what consciousness is and what, how does the brain act on the impulses that we receive from our sense organ. So basically, that those are the things that make up consciousness. And before we get to consciousness, which we're more likely to discuss in the next few topics, first, let's, us, let's look at the raw data that comes into our mind, which can be gathered by our sense organ through sensation and perception. All right. Now, so sensation and perception, those, those are two different processes. And it happens when, say for example, we interpret sound vibrations hitting your ear. From sound vibrations, we realize that these are not just any kind of sounds, but actually someone's calling your name. And that means that from raw data that comes into your sense organs, you were able to make sense out of this data and you're able to integrate the information with what you know from the past. Okay, so what I'm saying here is that you try to process the information in your brain in order for you to identify what is the information. What is it a certain information that you must be aware of? Is it your name? Is it the name of your parents, etc.? Okay, so in other words, the sense organs transform information from its physical form into a nerve impulse. So it sends the organs send action potentials to the brain. And then the brain is the one that organizes the information, interprets it, and then it will initiate a response if that would be necessary. So in other words, Everything that we experience right now, it's the collection of everything happening around you and how your brain decided to react to that experience. So in other words, we are getting information collectively from different sense organs, but as human beings, we have the capability to organize these experiences into one coherent experience that makes it meaningful for us. Now. So this is one example, okay? The information from the outside world, such as light, sound, other types of data, that's the raw data, okay? And then it will enter our body through our receptors, such as the eyes, the mouth, the nose, the ears, and even our skin. And then eventually, the these receptors would have to send the, inform the raw data to the brain in order for that information to be meaningful for us. Okay? Now, take note that sensation and perception are two different processes. Hence, they are defined differently. In other words, sensation is the physical process wherein sensation happens when experience or stimulus when there's a stimulation of our sense organs by features of the outside world, by these different stimuli. Okay, so whenever you're seeing something far from you, whenever you hear something, it sends um your your receptors will need to process that physical information, so that is sensation. But the moment that you organize that information in your brain and you interpret that sensory experience that changes into perception. So when you see something far from you, you see a person, then that's just sensation. But when you identify that the person is actually your sibling or your friend, that becomes perception because perception is the psychological side of this equation. Okay, so if you're familiar with Carl Jung, even Carl Jung himself said that there are four functions in the human body, which are sensation, sensing, thinking, feeling, and intuiting. So whenever you see, feel something, automatically sensing happens. When you identify what that object is, that's thinking. But the moment you say 
if you like or dislike the object, that's feeling. And when you use your imagination, that's intuition or intuiting. So in other words, there are different interpretations for different theories of what sensation perception is. But in this topic, we are just going to stick to these two important processes of sensation and perception. What's important for you is to understand that these two are two different things, but it doesn't mean that they are not connected because we know that from sensation, the brain converts that into a meaningful perception. Now, our perceptions may also be flooded by our past experiences. What if you've had a lot of negative experiences in the past, then we can expect that the way that you make sense of things will be alarming. So a simple joke or a simple um, statement made by a person can be perceived in a negative way. So in other words, our personality has also a lot to do with how we make sense of the information coming from the outside world. And let's know more about these important processes. All right, so now that I told you earlier that our consciousness is basically the awareness of what's happening around us. So basically, our sense organs are working 24-7. Okay, Even when we are asleep, sometimes when we hear a loud sound that's enough to wake us up from our deep sleep or from our light sleep. So imagine if you were constantly aware of, this, of these sensations, it will bombard your sense organs. That's why we have our own mechanism in order for us not to be overwhelmed by the information coming from the surrounding. This is what we call sensory adaptation. And the sensory adaptation is the process by which our sensitivity diminishes when an object constantly stimulates our senses. That's why at times you can no longer notice the sound of an alarm, the sound of noise in your surrounding, the sound of machinery, you tend not to notice these things anymore because they have been there for quite some time. You will only notice their absence the moment that someone turns off that machine or that stimulus moves away from your sensation or from the field where you can observe them. That's why there are some instances wherein you get used to your wallpaper or you don't remember the let the colors of the letters in Google because you see these things every day and you just decided that this information are not no longer important to you anymore. That's why you decided not to pay attention to those information anymore. Now, how do these raw data gets converted into psychological information? We make use of what we call transduction. So the when these organs receive information from the outside world, it is converted into a neural information going into the spinal cord or into the brain. Okay, so that's the process of transduction. Okay, so it's transduction when the sense organs are now sending information to the brain where it will be processed further. There are times that there are changes in the environment, but these changes are not significant enough for us to observe them. There are sounds that are so soft that we can no longer hear those sounds. There are times that there are movements in the surrounding, but we cannot see that something or someone is moving. Okay? That's what we call the absolute threshold. So when we see absolute threshold, that's the lowest intensity level of a stimulus a person can detect half of the time. So it answers the following questions such as, when do we go from not seeing an object or event to sensing it? What is the softest sound that you can hear? The intensity level that a participant can see 50% of the time is that person's absolute threshold for light. So what they do is that in order for scientists to know what your absolute threshold is, what they do is that they can flash different intensities of light 
and then they will ask the person can you see this light and then if you can see that intensity that certain intensity of light for 50 percent of the time five out of ten times then it means that is your absolute threshold for light so what what can we learn about it is that since we have different participants in an experiment then they may report that they have different absolute thresholds meaning that some people can be more sensitive than others okay so say for example musicians are more sensitive than non-musicians in inspecting the sound of their instruments if it's in tune or not right so Say, for example, maybe construction workers are more adept at observing tiny pieces while they're fixing something. And those who work in the aviation industry may be more sensitive in stimuli that pops up in their radar. Okay, so different people tend to have different absolute thresholds or some people may be more sensitive than others. But the, most, the main idea here is that people have an absolute threshold. Sometimes we get to see something, but sometimes we don't see it all the time. Okay, so it's like a continuum from not seeing to completely seeing a certain stimulus. So what, what are the examples of absolute thresholds from the different sense organs that we have? So first, for touch. Our absolute threshold is the sound, uh, is the feeling that a wing of a fly falling on your cheek from a distance of one centimeter. For vision, it's a candle flame seen at 30 miles on a clear night. For hearing, it's the tick of a watch under quiet conditions at 20 feet. For smell, it's the drop of perfume diffused into entire volume of air in a six-room apartment. And for taste, it's one teaspoon of sugar in two gallons of water. So those are interesting discoveries of what are the typical absolute thresholds for the different sense organ. Okay, now, now that you know about absolute threshold, the next question is, when can you say that there are changes in the stimulus that you are currently observing? So once you already perceive a stimulus, how much does it need to change for it to be noticeable, for the change to be noticeable enough? Okay, so now let me introduce the concept of difference threshold or just notice noticeable difference to you. So that is defined as the smallest amount of change between two stimuli that a person can detect half of the time. So related to what I'm telling to you earlier, a talented guitarist tuning his guitar would have a higher G and D sensitivity than someone who does not play the guitar. All right. So now that I introduce the difference threshold to you, I also would like to point out that sometimes we think that a certain stimulus is changing even though it is not. So our mind, our or our sense organs can be deceiving. There is there was one experiment in social psychology wherein there are around five people I think who were in a dark room and they were observing a a red light from a laser from a laser pointer and then their task is to say if the if the red pointer is moving or not. This was actually an experiment about conformity. So guess what? The, here's the condition. Conformity condition and non-conformity condition or control. In the conformity condition, respondents or subjects are put in a condition wherein they are together with people who claim that they see the light move even though it's not really moving. So sometimes the perception of people around us can also change the way that we make sense of things. Isn't that interesting? So let's move on. Other than that, here's one more thing that can influence your perception. It's your perceptual set. That's your frame of mind when you are encoding something into the brain and that frame of mind can influence how you make sense of the experience. 
So the effect of the frame of, of mind on perception, it has a tendency to perceive a stimulus in a certain manner. Say, for example, this classic exercise wherein you have to read the following or say how do you read the following like TWA as twa, TWE as twe, but TWO is supposed to be read to be read as two. Okay, so sometimes our frame of mind may influence how we see a certain object. Like what you can see on the screen, if I tell you one, two, three, four, five, then what you can see on the right side of the screen is the number 13. But if we are reciting the alphabet, then maybe we'll say letter B. So it doesn't only influence our perception, but sometimes it also influences bigger ideas. Like in politics, people who hold particular political beliefs will perceive any event in a way that it is consistent with those beliefs. So sometimes our frame of mind influence how we make sense of things to the point that it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. The I told you so phenomenon that every change in the environment back in 2012, they said that it's going to predict the end of the world. So that's how our perception, our perceptual set influences our ideas and our processing of these ideas. The first thing that we are going to talk about in this lecture is vision. Because humans are predominantly visual creatures, we rely mostly on vision in making sense of our experiences. Because from the evolutionary perspective, vision allows us to know where we are. are we, can we survive in this environment? Can we thrive in this environment? Okay, Where are we? Who are the people around us? And when we identify the people around us, vision helps us know what other people might want from us. So there are cultural factors here as well. So for example, establishing eye-to-eye -eye contact may be considered not desirable in certain cultures, but it is considered ideal in some other cultures to establish sincerity when conversing with each other. And lastly, also from the evolutionary perspective, vision allows us to identify whether there is danger nearby. So in, in order for us to engage in the fight or flight response, then we need to identify if there is a threat okay, near us. Now, the eye is involved in sensing a visual stimulus but it is not the only way to see. So we do not only see with the eye, we also see with the brain. Okay, so the eye is just one part of, of the way, is one part of the equation of making sense of a visual stimulus. So what does the eye do? It bends the light, converts the light energy into neural energy. So now we can see some action potential coming from our eyes to the brain. And then it sends that information to the brain for further processing. So the eye is the gateway to vision, but very little of what we experience as vision actually happens in the eye. Visual perception happens in the brain with input from the eye. This is a good summary of what happens when we sense visual information with our eyes. So first and foremost, the light will enter at the cornea. It is a clear hard covering that protects our lenses. Then specifically, this light will go to the interior of the eye through the pupil or the opening in the iris. Then after that, the light will go through the lens, which will bend the light rays. Later, I will show you a picture for you to understand what's happening in the lens. And then through accommodation, muscles around the lens alter its shape to adjust viewing objects at different distances and to allow the lens to focus light on the retina. So this is how we know that something is far and something is near. Then eventually the light hits the retina. It travels through several layers of cells before processing in the brain begins.
So let's take a look at the image that I'm going to present for us to see these steps. Okay? Okay. Now that we know the different parts of the eye, it is important for us to know as well a very important part of the eye which are photoreceptors. So these photoreceptors allow us to make sense of what we see by converting the information into neural information. And there are two photoreceptors in our eyes, the rods and the cones. So they basically have a similar function. They differ in one important aspect wherein rods are photoreceptors that function in low illumination and play a key role in night vision. In other words, it is responsive to dark and light contrast. It is also responsible for what we call dark adaptation. That's why when you turn off the light, suddenly it appears that you cannot see anything, but 30 minutes after that, it is easier for you to see in the dark. So rods are responsible of dark adaptation. On the other hand, cones are photoreceptors that are responsible for color vision that are most functional in the conditions of bright light. So it's, it helps us in visual acuity or our ability to see clearly. It depends on our cones. So let me show you the image now of the parts of the eye. So there you go. So the information enters through the cornea and then through the pupil in the iris, which will eventually, it will go through the lens eventually and the lens will bend the light and it will look upside down with when, when it is reflected in the retina. So if everything would be upside down when the information enters our eye, then the world will be upside down, right? However, our brain is smart enough to correct that information during processing. That's why the world is not upside down. Okay, and then in the retina, we can see that there will be a lot of cells here, which includes our photoreceptors. So let's see that. Okay, so this is an image of how cells look like, specifically how our photoreceptors look like together with other cells like the bipolar cells, ganglion cells, and the optic nerve. So basically the eye hits, the light hits the back of the eye and then it's, it gets processed following the arrows here. So when the light hits the back of the eye, okay, the information gets processed, then eventually it will be transported into the brain through what we call the blind spot. Okay, so let's look at the image here on the left. So this is how rods and cones look like. These are cones and these are rods. So on the right screen, this is the cone while this is the rod, an example of rods and cones. So after this processing, the information leaves the eye and then it's now on its way going to the brain. All right, so after transduction or the conversion of physical information into neural information at the photoreceptor layer, visual information is now processed by different layers of cells in the retina, like what I told you. Then that information will exit through the blind spot and then the optic nerve transmits the signals from the eye to the brain. And this optic nerve exits the eye through what we call the blind spot. Let's talk about normal vision, nearsightedness, and farsightedness. So among people with normal vision, the lens projects the image to hit just on the retina. However, among people with nearsightedness or people who are myopic, the images focus slightly in front of the retina. So when they wear corrective glasses, that projection becomes corrected. Okay, so it, now it hits the retina, not in front of the retina. Among farsighted or hyperopic individuals, okay, the image is focused behind the retina, 
so they use a plus lens for correction so that the image will be projected exactly on the retina so as people age the lens becomes less flexible and it is more likely than that the image visual image will focus behind the retina so presbyopia is an age related difficulty in seeing or vision now that you know how we see with our eyes it's important for you to know how do we see with our brain okay now i told you before that our brain works contralaterally so the information from the left side of the from the left side of our vision goes to the right part of the brain and the right visual field information goes to the left part of the brain contralateral and this happens in the optic chiasm this is the point where um, the strands of the optic nerve from half of the eye cross over to the opposite part of the brain so let's take this one example say for example let's look at the blue lines here in the image so the blue line basically represents the left visual field you might be wondering why is it that the left visual field is on the right part of the eye it's because that's the part of the eye where information from the left side gets projected to okay now as you can see the left visual field of the right eye it's it still goes to the right part of the brain but in order for the right visual field of the left eye to go to the right side of the brain it needs to cross the optic chiasm so at the end of the day all the blue lines go to the right part of the brain while all the red lines which means right visual field goes to go to the left side of the brain then eventually it will the information will go to our thalamus which is our relay center and the thalamus in turn will direct that information to the occipital lobe or to the visual cortex in the occipital lobe where we see with our brain all right so that's where we process the information further now there are some important discoveries with regards to the role of the visual cortex in the occipital lobe of the brain one important discovery is that there are specific neurons that are activated only for very specific types of visual information so basically think about it perhaps there is a certain part of the brain that only gets activated when you see circles or when you see squares there are some research saying that there is also a tendency for people wherein a certain part of our brain becomes active only when we see a certain face. For example, most of the people are familiar with the face of Jesus Christ or the face of, say for example, celebrities. Then there was also, perhaps there's also a part of the brain that gets activated whenever you see these familiar images. So specifically, their discovery is that some neurons fire only to angled lines some only to movement and some only to edges and these are what they call feature detectors so feature detectors are neurons in the visual cortex that analyze the retinal image and respond to specific aspects of shapes such as angles and movements and what is the proof that there are certain feature detectors in our brain so let's take a look at the next slide here all right so let's look at, first let's look at image b on the right part of our screen so image b you can see here that there are vertical lines along the horizontal line here so the more vertical lines that you can see it means that the more firing that happens in that certain area or receptor okay, or feature detector i mean in our brain now so in this certain feature detector based on what what you can see on the right part of our screen it is active on what vertical or horizontal quadrilateral so it only fires when it sees 
a vertical quadrilateral. So how did they input this information to the participant? Let's look at the left side. So basically, there's a rotating rectangle in the that these people can see in their visual field. And what they did is that they inserted an electrode that will tell if that part of the brain gets active when they see this this rectangle. So they, they rotate it 360 degrees and they discover that the the part of the brain that they are observing is not active when the rectangle is placed horizontally in front of them, but as it goes closer to a vertical position then they observe greater amount of activity in that part of the brain. And when that rectangle begins to turn into horizontal position again, then there was also a reduction in the activity. So that's interesting, right? So this does not only work with rectangles, sometimes it works with, with certain lines or edges. That's why they're called feature detectors so in summary the eye is where we sense visual information and the brain is where we make sense of what we have sensed or perceive it but making sense or perceiving the neural information from the eye involves many different acts of perception such as color motion depth size and patterns among others first Let's talk about color. Color is not really a property of the object, it's a property of us. Our perception of color depends on our photoreceptors, our brains, and the physical characteristics of the objects. Primates, humans included, have three kinds of cones. Sensitive to red, to green, and to blue. Wavelengths of light. That's why we are called trichromatic. All mammals other then primates are sensitive to only two pigments. That's why they are dichromatic. While many birds and fish are sensitive to more colors. That's why they're called tetrachromatic. Okay, color perception is partly determined by the wavelength measured in billions of a meter or nanometers. So the spectrum of color visible to humans ranges from 350 nanometer to 750 nanometers. So this is the spectrum of wavelengths that you can see on the screen right now. So this explains why we cannot see other waves in the environment such as X-rays, ultraviolet rays, microwave radar, TV, etc. Because we can, there's only a short continuum that we can observe and these belong to the 350 to 750 nanometers. In the human eye, the 350 nanometer is considered as the color violet, while the 750 nanometer is, is perceived as the color red. So let's see some more specifics about how we understand color. First theory of color vision is the trichromatic color theory, which says that all color that we observe all color that we experience results from mixing of three colors of light. Okay, so sometimes we see yellow, sometimes we see brown, sometimes we see different shades of red, different kinds of blue. So the theory, this theory of color vision says that there are only three colors and everything that we see results from how we combine these three colors in our brain. However, this theory of color vision has a shortcoming. It does not explain after images or the fact that there are times wherein we still see something, although it's not already there. It already, it's already absent from where it used to be, but we still used to see something. Okay, let's say, for example, changing from your browser to your desktop. Say, for example, you're watching a video, then you suddenly change to a white background. There are times wherein you still see some sort of after images from the video that you were watching moments ago. So this was not taken into account by the trichromatic color theory. So 
what are the possible explanations to that. Next is the opponent process theory of color vision. Okay, so this is the theory of color vision saying that our cones are linked together in three opposing colors so that activation of one member of the pair inhibits the activity in the other. And this is these are the ways that cones are paired together. Blue is paired to yellow, red is to green, and black is to white. So eventually, if you keep seeing something colored blue and your eyes get tired of it, then there's a tendency for you to see something yellow. This explains why surgeons wear green colored um, clothes or gear when they are doing an operation so that when their eyes get tired of seeing the color red, they can somehow refresh their tired vision by looking at something colored green. And that explains the illusion that I'm going to show to you in the next slide. So try staring at this image for around 30 seconds to a minute. Feel free to pause the video if you need to do so. Then eventually after 30 seconds, we can look at this slide. So if you have looked at that image long enough for your certain cones to get tired, you are more likely to see the image of the US flag in this white screen. And that explains the implications of the opponent process theory of color vision. Now let's talk about deficiencies on color vision. Only about 10 people in a million actually fail to see color at all. So color blindness refers to the weakness or deficiency of the perception of certain colors and perhaps one explanation is that there are certain problems in their cones. That's why certain colors are not detected. So you can see two images here on the lower portion of your slide. So if you can see the discrepancies between the image on the left and on the right, it means that you are less likely to have color blindness because those people with color blindness will only see what you can see on the right side of the screen but if you can see that there are color differences in the two images then that means that you know the distinction between the two or in other words you know that there are so many colors present in this image and then these colors are no longer that vibrant on the on the right image on the screen other than color we also perceive motion so we perceive movement when an object moves across the retina two factors contribute to how we perceive movement of objects the background against which an object moves and the size of the object sometimes we think that smaller objects moves faster than larger objects. Sometimes we can convince ourselves that something is moving although it is not. Like in the laser red point led, red colored laser experiment that I shared shared to you earlier in this lecture. That is called apparent motion. We can be fooled into thinking that something is moving when it is not. Next, how do we understand depth? How do we know that something is farther than another object? So here are some monocular depth cues. These monocular depth cues aid to depths, to depth perception that do not require two eyes. Because one of the theories in depth perception says that we have two eyes because we need to integrate information from these two eyes in order for us to see something in 3D. In order for us to know that an object is near or far. That's why 3D movies work because there are two cameras working alongside allowing you to have a 3D vision of the images on screen. But the question is, how about those people who have experienced eye damage or blinded in one eye? So they need to rely on monocular or single eye depth cues. So they aid in the perception of depth 
even though it doesn't require two eyes. So here are the following first linear perspective. So if something looks large in front of you, but it looks smaller as it goes farther away from you, that's linear perspective. That's how you know that something is far and something is near. The next is texture gradient. You can see the details in front of you. They are, these flowers are different. They're not the same. They're not connected to each other. These are different flowers. But as they go further, you can see that they tend to clump up together. And that's how you can say that these objects are not near, but rather they are far from you. Next is atmospheric perspective, like what you can see in image C, which means that something that's far away from you is somehow blurred by fogs or they tend to be blurry when they are far so that is the atmospheric perspective and next is the interposition so you can you know that this one is behind these two because you can see these two and you cannot see the last um object because it is behind these first two objects so that's also one way of saying that image um, object C is farther than A and B because I can no longer see it when it is blocked by A and B. So sometimes we can be fooled by optical illusions such as this. Sometimes we cannot train our mind to think in a certain way. Sometimes our mind takes certain shortcuts. Say for example, this illusion asking people which of the two is longer which of the two vertical lines would be longer. People will typically say that the one on the right is longer, but actually they have the same length. Here's the horizon illusion. It makes you think that the image of the moon is large, larger compared to when the moon is, let's say, up here. Because we have the tendency to see objects as larger if they are closer to the horizon. Other than that, what you can see here on the right makes us think that this one is bigger than this one. Because sometimes we have the tendency to think that objects that are farther can be bigger in certain instances. We also know that when things change position or distance in relation to us, they remain the same. Okay, sometimes when we see a person walking away from us, they look smaller and smaller and smaller, or sometimes they look faster. But in reality, they don't look, they don't become smaller, they just look smaller because we have what we call perceptual constancy. So these images on our retinas change shape and size. As they move through space however we have perceptual constancy or the ability of the brain to preserve perception of objects in spite of changes in retinal image when an object changes in position or distance so they only look smaller or bigger but they are not really changing in height or weight okay so these are some examples of shape constancy when you open a door you know that the shape is still the same although the way it looks in front of us changes when we open it, right? And look at the image here on the left side of the screen. We think that this violates what we know so far because the boy on the left looks a lot smaller than the girl on the right, but actually they're not on the same, they're not at the same distance. The boy stands further than the girl, as you can see, on image B here. So that gives us the illusion, the setup of the room gives us the illusion that they are standing at the same distance, but actually the boy is standing farther away from the point, the position of the girl. Let us also review some Gestalt principles that affect our perception. So it came from the word Gestalt, which is German, that means form pattern, shape, or whole. So we give credit to Max Werdener, Kurt Kofka, and Wolfgang Koller in their contributions of the Gestalt principles. So the first Gestalt principle that I want 
you to recall is the law of similarity, wherein if I show you the image on the right, you are not going to say that there are 20, 20 dots on the screen, but rather you are more likely to say that there are two rows of blue dots and there are two rows of red dots. So we tend to group things together that look similar. So that's the law of similarity. We also have the law of closure wherein we know that A, um, this one looks like a circle even though it's there are certain parts that are not visible. This looks like a triangle and this also looks like a triangle because of the law of closure and this is definitely an image of a dock. So we have the tendency to perceive a whole object even in the absence of complete information. So that's the law of closure. And we also have the figure and ground. So the figure and ground, the figure is the specific object in front, while the ground is the background behind objects or figures. So like what we to what I told you earlier, your perceptual set or the or how you have framed your mind may also affect what you can see here on the screen. So sometimes it looks like there are two persons talking at each other well sometimes it looks like there's some a chalice like symbol or a cup like symbol that is colored in blue green here so the sometimes the figure and the ground contrast each other and we tend to create different interpretations of what we can see based on the figure and the ground this time let's talk about hearing so just like vision hearing starts when we begin to sense sound waves from the environment so similar to vision as well sound waves must travel through a medium or else we cannot hear them unlike vision though sound waves travel much slower compared to light waves that's why we hear a thunder after seeing the lightning. Here are some important terms in the psychophysics of sound and hearing. So it's affected, hearing is affected by three physical properties of the sound wave, namely the amplitude, frequency, and purity. When we say amplitude, it refers to the sound waves that we perceive as loudness measured in terms of decibels. So a soft whisper is about 30 decibels. Our regular human conversation is about 55 to 60 decibels. A very loud bar or nightclub is around 110 to 100 to 110. A jet airplane is about 130 to 140. While blue whales, blue whales produce loudest sounds of any living animal ever recorded reaching up to 188. So the higher the loudness goes, the more dangerous it is for our hearing, and we have the potential of suffering from hearing damage or hearing loss. Next, let's, let's talk about the frequency. The frequency talks about the waves, how many waves occur in a given period of time. It is what we perceive as the pitch of the sound, or it's measured in terms of hertz. So sounds below 20 hertz are called subsonic and above 20,000 hertz are called ultrasonic. So the pitch or most sounds that we hear ranges from 400 to 4,000 and the human voice generally produces sounds ranging from 200 to 800 hertz. So if, if amplitude is close to the loudness, frequency is close to the pitch, now let's talk about purity. Purity, on the other hand, is the complexity of the wave. So the unique tonal quality of the sound is, for Filipinos, it's pronounced as timbre of the voice, but in American, this is timbre. So it allows you to distinguish the sound of a piano from the sound of a guitar. So that's the purity or how unique is the sound perceived. How do we interpret the sound waves from our environment? First, the sound, as you know, it goes through the ear, but the ears have little to do with hearing itself. So in the outer ear, the ear is divided into three major subdivisions, outer ear, middle ear, and inner ear. 
The, out, the external structures called pinea collect and funnel sounds into passage called auditory canal. Sound vibration travel to the eardrum, also known as the tympanic membrane. And that's how the sound waves enter the middle ear. The middle ear. The sound waves on the tympanic membrane or the eardrum set into motion the bones of the middle ear, namely the hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup. The role of these three bones is to amplify the waves so that they have more than 20 times the energy they had entering the ear. And now it enters the inner ear. And what are the structures in the inner ear? First, we have some semicircular canals that play a key role in maintaining our balance. So those are the semicircular canals. Here are they in the images. And we also have the cochlea, which is the bony tube of the inner ear, which is curled like a snail shell, and it is filled with fluid. Inside the cochlea, we have the basilar membrane, a membrane that runs through the cochlea. So the basilar membrane cont contains hair cells which transform the physical characteristics of a sound into neural information, which will be relayed to the brain. So, more specifics about the hair cells. The smallest hair cells are nearest the oval window, and the largest hair cells are coiled up in the center of the snail-like structure or the cochlea. The smallest cells are sensitive to highest frequencies up to 20,000 hertz, while the largest hair cells are sensitive to lowest frequencies. The louder the sound, the bigger the vibration in the cochlear fluid, the more stimulation of the hair cells, the faster the rate of the action potentials in the auditory nerve, and the louder the sound we perceive. Now, in the brain, auditory neurons transmit the sound impulses to the thalamus, and then the thalamus will further relay the information to the part of the brain responsible for making sense of what we hear. It is it includes the brain stem, but more importantly, the temporal lobe, or the home of the auditory cortex. Here are some tips for you to prevent possible hearing loss. So when you are listening to sounds with the use of headset of earphones, try using, try not setting it to greater than 6 on a 10 notch scale. So stick to 60% or lower of the maximum volume. If someone can hear your earphone leakage from several feet away, then it only means that it is too loud. If someone has ringing in the ears or feeling of fullness in the ear, or, or if speech sounds are muffled after listening session, after a listening session, then it means that the music was too loud. It is better to try over-the-ear headphones rather than earbuds to prevent potential hearing loss. Now let's talk about the bodily senses. The largest contact surface area any sensory input has with our bodies would be our skin. So when we talk about bodily senses, the senses base in the skin, the body, or any membrane surfaces. So it's false to say that bodily senses are only those that are felt by our skin because we also sense things that are inside our bodies. And there are at least six distinct bodily or somatic senses, namely touch, temperature, pain, position or motion, balance, and interoception. Now let's talk specifically about touch. In touch, there are mechanoreceptors at work. Okay, so the top layers of the skin have receptor cells that are sensitive to different tactile qualities. You have fewer receptors on the soles of your feet compared to your fingertips. That's why your fingertips are much more sensitive to touch than, your, than the soles of your feet. When something touches our fingertip, forearm, or shoulder, a dedicated region of the cortex becomes active. Tactile sensations from our skin travel via the sensory neurons to the spinal cord, then ultimately to the brain. The first major structure involved in processing bodily information or bodily sensation is the thalamus. 
which then relays that information to the somatosensory cortex in the parietal lobe. Now let's talk about pain. So we define pain as a complex emotional and sensory experience associated with actual or potential tissue damage. There are some people who experience phantom limb pain wherein they already lost an arm or a leg but they continue to feel pain in that lost limb. So that's a surprising discovery in the history of neuropsychology. Also, pain is not just the direct result of tissue damage, but an experience of the brain as well. Let's talk about pain perception. We have what we call nociceptive pain or pain from skin and or tissue damage or injury. So this is a partial list of brain structure activated by skin-based pain. They include thalamus, hypothalamus, limbic system, insula, and the anterior cingulate cortex. Some of the same brain regions and neurochemicals activated when we also experience physical pain are also activated during emotional pain. That's why experiencing emotional pain is just like experiencing physical pain. That's why we really dislike experiencing emotional setbacks. Okay? Specifically, the brain regions active in both physical and emotional pain are the anterior cingulate cortex and the insula. So they are highly involved in the perception of pain. These are the same brain regions that are activated when we observe someone getting hurt. So they are not only activated when we are hurt, they are also activated when we are looking at someone getting hurt. Those who are born without the ability to experience pain also do not get to experience pain when others get hurt. Now let's talk about the chemical senses of smell and taste. So these two are connected. They respond to contact with molecules from objects we encounter in the world. So unlike receptors from, uh, for other senses, receptors for chemical molecules are regularly replaced every few weeks. First, let's talk about smell or olfaction. So there are olfactory sensory neurons, the sensory receptors for smell that reside high up inside the nose. And the nose contains hair-like projections called cilia. When chemicals come in contact with the cilia, it gets transformed into neural information called transduction. And when transduction happens, the olfactory message travels to the olfactory bulb in the forebrain. The primary olfactory area is the temporal lobe, while the secondary olfactory area is the frontal lobe. On the other hand, let's talk about taste. The textured structure in the tongue are called papillae, and they contain about 10,000 taste buds. And these taste buds are well spread across our tongue. That's why the belief before that there are only specific parts of the tongue responsible for a certain taste, like sweet, bitter, etc., it's no longer followed nowadays because we discovered that these taste buds are well spread throughout the tongue. Okay, and there's an increasing evidence that a sixth taste quality might be added called fattiness. And both smell and taste are involved in the experience of flavor. That's why you say sometimes that when you smell something, it's like that you have already tasted that thing. Then lastly, let's talk about synesthesia. So synesthesia is a weird phenomenon experienced by around 4% of the population wherein people tend to report that they see sounds when they're supposed to hear them and hear colors when they are supposed to see them. Synesthesia occurs when the senses get mixed up and they don't stay separate. Now, this is one example of synesthesia. What you can see here on the screen is that the certain person with synesthesia attributed certain colors to the numbers that he can see. So I wonder how this truly happens when you feel it. This is the only way I can demonstrate synesthesia to you now. Some says that synesthesia happens 
when you have taken a certain substance or drug and we can discuss them sometime soon now so basically that is it for our discussion of sensation and perception i hope that you learned something about the basics of how do we make sense of the world because after the, our discussion, after our lesson about sensation and perception, you will learn more about how do we organize information in the brain, such as, such as learning, experience, memory, etc. So that is it for our discussion for today. And I do hope that you learned a lot. Thank you.